Good morning, everyone. Today we're here to talk about home heating, weatherization, and buttoning up Vermont homes. Peter Walk will give an update from Efficiency Vermont, Tim Perrin from Vermont Gas, and Commissioner Winters from the Department of Children and Families. But first, a couple of other quick updates. You may remember a few weeks ago, we talked about our plans to deconstruct mobile homes that were impacted by the summer's floods. And some of you know, um, I put together a program when I was Lieutenant Governor after Tropical Storm Irene, where we deconstructed and removed condemned units at no cost to the owners. So after this year's flooding, we saw the need again, unfortunately, uh, because it can cost thousands of dollars and we wanted to make sure those who lost their homes didn't need the uh, have the extra uh, added burden and worry about deconstruction and removal and how to pay for it. So we wanted to make sure that they could um, they could focus on their next steps instead. So we use some of the generous donation from Ernie Bach of New England Subaru to offset the costs, and we've had a number of volunteers, equipment dealers, and contractors who have stepped up. To help as well. We've already deconstructed most of the units at River Run in Berlin and the mobile home park in Johnson. We'll have a few more left in Johnson soon and we have another park in Berlin that we need to uh, to address. So again I want to thank all those who have donated this to the cause helping with their time, labor, equipment and expertise to help those impacted by the devastated floods and it's been a real team effort to get us to where we are today. <clears throat> Next, a quick update uh, on our effort to help flood impacted homes or repair or replace their heating systems. As I shared a few weeks ago, uh, we've sent 267 names to a team of utilities, Efficiency Vermont and the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, and they've been working to get those systems fixed. As of the end of last week, 47 of those now have working systems, with 33 either scheduled or working with a technician now to schedule. By making these direct connections, we've identified 20 people who need other structural work done in order to get their heat on, and we have a team of state employees who have volunteered to serve as temporary flood case managers who are helping these folks and a few dozen more identified through this survey to get the help they need. We expect to hear more progress from our partners in the coming days, so these numbers are all likely higher, but either way, we're making progress. And here's what's interesting about this. We now have helped uh, about 100 people that we, uh, we've either uh, been able to help or are working to help uh, with problems we probably wouldn't have known about if we hadn't gone out and asked. So I want to use this as an example. For those who weren't impacted by flooding, don't forget you may have neighbors who are still struggling. And if you can take a few minutes to stop by, call or text to see if they need some help, I think we'll continue to find there are many out there who do. So that would be tremendously helpful. And if you don't know how to help, uh, you can call us at 828-3333. Uh, so that we can get involved to get the help they need. Lastly, with cold weather upon us and probably here to stay, I thought it was important to continue spreading the word on the many programs available to help Vermonters with their home heating bills and making sure their homes are more energy efficient. Weatherization is an important tool in our toolbox because it's a win-win. That's why I propose and work with the legislature to secure tens of millions of dollars for these efforts over the last uh, few years. Uh, not only does it reduce costs, helping make our state more affordable, but it also reduces greenhouse gas emissions, helping further our climate goals. Peter and Tim uh, will talk about the work Efficiency Vermont and Vermont Gas have uh, done in this space, and Commissioner Winters will also go over the programs we have to support weatherization. He'll also talk about LIHEAP funding, available to help Vermonters uh, with their heat, home heating bills. Uh, as we all know, uh, the cost of fuel has only added to the financial burden many families are feeling due to inflation. This program, supported by the federal government, uh, can help those struggling to heat their homes pay their bills, 
and I want to thank our congressional delegation for all their work uh, to secure the funding uh, that we need here in Vermont. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Peter. Good morning. Thank you, Governor, for having us here today. Uh, Button Up is an important yearly event, a statewide uh, rollout of opportunities to help Vermonters uh, improve the quality of their home, the warmth and comfort of their home, and to help the state reduce its overall greenhouse gas emissions picture. Uh, this has been a, an incredibly challenging year between inflation, conflicts all over the world that are having an impact on global fuel prices, the flooding here at home, uh, Everything is putting pressure upon the budgets of Vermonters and their ability to pay for and be comfortable in their own homes. We are thinking long and hard and trying to work with all the partners here today to help Vermonters be able to be, uh, be able to afford their heat, be able to be more comfortable and to, and to have the healthy lifestyle that, uh, that comes from that work. Uh, one of the things that we're also thinking about deeply in this state and as a result of the floods is how do we make our homes more resilient? Uh, insulating and air sealing can reduce our home energy use, but also the health and safety and overall comfort of our homes. Helping to uh, re reduce challenges related to moisture and airflow issues can reduce mold pressures and other uh, pests and other draft issues. Um, we can make sure that when we're without power, as we saw multiple times throughout the year last year in different storms, uh, a weatherized home can keep you warmer or cooler longer in that home. So these are many things that we're thinking about as you're looking, if, as Vermonters are looking to uh, see where to start, there are lots of opportunities uh, for, to engage and to take on small projects, to take on large projects. Uh, not everything needs to be full-scale weatherization. There are many tips and tricks along the way to help. Uh, a few new things about, uh, about uh, Button Up this year is uh, Efficiency Vermont for low and moderate income Vermonters has increased the incentives to up to 75% of the project costs, up to $9,500 for a weatherization project. Uh, this makes buttoning up all of our homes more accessible and more affordable to lower those long-term costs and make, make Vermont more affordable to live in, in the long run. Um, this, you'll hear this from Commissioner Winters, but through the Community Action Agencies and the Office of Economic Opportunity at DCF, there are opportunities for low-income Vermonters to have uh, no-cost weatherization services provided. Uh, we are also working with partners around the state to make uh, upfront capital available through low-cost home energy loans from uh, different partners and uh, working on a collaborative project between the distribution utilities, Vermont Gas, and the housing, uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency to make it possible to pay back the cost of those, uh, those upgrades on your uh, utility bill. Um, we're also trying to make sure, as the governor mentioned, there are flood resources available for Vermonter. So if you are dealing with uh, weatherization activities or needing to replace heating systems and you are uh, fall into that uh, lower moderate income category, we're able to help with additional resources there. Uh, as I mentioned, the button up campaign is a campaign for a reason. It's a, a way to help Vermonters understand where to start. You can reach out to Efficiency Vermont and do a virtual home energy visit. There are opportunities for DIY, uh, uh, small changes along the way. Um, and we've been ho hosting a series of, of, of webinars. We're, we have another one coming up on November 8th, uh, which is Heat Pumps 101. Those tend to be very popular. People are interested in the new technology and how it might work for them. Uh, please reach out to us if you have any questions uh, so we continue to work. Uh, with that, I will hand it off to Tim and really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about this important program. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Governor Scott, for the opportunity to highlight this year's Button Up campaign and the many benefits of home weatherization. At VGS, we're focused on ways to help Vermonters reduce their heating bills, make buildings safer and more resilient, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Energy efficiency can help us achieve all of these goals. Many homes have so much heat loss from air leaking through the gaps, cracks, and holes to the outdoors that it's like leaving a window open all winter long. Fortunately, this year's Button Up campaign can offer energy saving tips and resources to help reduce air leaking out of your home and keep the heat in. 
Weatherization is about warmth. VGS has been a committed partner in this work for over 30 years. We've helped support over 45,000 improvements to Vermonters homes and businesses. And with our partners like Efficiency Vermont, the Weatherization Assistance Program, FEMA, and many others all working together, we aim to accomplish even more on this front. Weatherization works and we're helping build the workforce needed to weatherize 120,000 homes by 2030, which is Vermont's goal for the decade. For many families, it can be difficult to fit these types of projects into the average household budget. Thanks to generous incentives and on-bill financing that Peter had mentioned, weatherizing had never, has never been easier or more affordable. VGS offers our, rebates, our, our customers rebates for comprehensive weatherization improvements based on income qualification. For moderate income households, that actually represents over half of our customers. We have 75% up to $5,000 and have recently announced a um, enhanced incentive for income qualified customers going up to $9,500 for those to be able to cover 75% of the costs of a weatherization project. The Weatherization Repayment Assistance Program, a form of on-bill financing, is now offered across much of the state and allows customers to finance the cost of their weatherization project on their VGS or electric bill. VGS is also a partner for the Weatherization and Health Initiative to help improve health outcomes for childhood asthma patients through weatherization and other improvements. Please check out www.vgsvt.com to learn about the rebates and financing options available today. You can request an energy evaluation or more information right on our website. In closing, too many v Vermont families and businesses were affected by the July floods and our heart goes out to you. VGS has been part of a coalition of utilities and contractors to help Vermonters build back better with more efficient heating systems and weatherizing buildings to be more resilient and reduce energy costs. We know there's a lot more work to be done and thank our partners joining me here and so many more for their support. Thank you. I'm going to turn it over to the Commissioner of the Department of Children's and Families, Chris Winters. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Governor. I'm pleased to let people know about a few important programs that we run out of the Department for Children and Families. It's the Home Weatherization Assistance Program and the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, also known as LIHEAP. These benefits and services help support DCF's mission to foster the healthy development, safety, well being, and self sufficiency of Vermonters. As a department, we provide assistance to some 200,000 Vermonters each year, including children, youth, families, older Vermonters, and people with disabilities. First, Vermont's Home Weatherization Assistance Program exists to improve the energy efficiency of income eligible Vermonters' homes to save them money that in turn helps them pay for the other necessities of life. The weatherization program on average saves 30% of a household's energy usage each year. The program's non-energy benefits include a safer, more comfortable home with better indoor air quality and safe combustion appliances. The health benefits of living in a weatherized home are documented and significant. Weatherization also reduces significant greenhouse gas emissions. This program directly employs over 175 Vermonters across the state who work at six local weatherization programs in the State Office of Economic Opportunity. The program hires approximately 130 subcontractors each year including electricians, plumbers, heating contractors, and abatement contractors. Both state and federal funds are used to weatherize lower income households each year. This year, $27 million are granted out to weatherize over 1,500 homes, both owner-occupied and rental units, including large multifamily apartment buildings. The Vermont Home Weatherization Assistance Program is a comprehensive and effective whole house energy efficiency program that's free of charge to income qualified Vermonters. You can apply at your local community action program or weatherization assistance program or find an application on our website at dcf.vermont.gov. The Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, or LIHEAP, can help eligible households stay warm and stay safe in the winter weather 
by providing assistance with your home heating bills. The seasonal fuel program provides a cash benefit, which is sent to the household's fuel dealer as a credit for future deliveries. Households that heat with wood or pellets receive a benefit on their EBT card, which can be used to pay for those wood or pellets. The LIHEAP program also supports crisis assistance for home heating costs through community action agencies. Households that have used their seasonal fuel benefit through the Economic Services Division can also apply directly through their local community action agency for additional fuel assistance. The community action agencies also support households between 185% and 200% of the federal poverty level, which is above the limit for the seasonal fuel program. Based on our anticipated federal award, the average benefit for a Vermonter who qualifies will be just under $900. The program typically supports about 18,500 households per year. Applications can be submitted online through our website at one of our district offices or by mail. Again, visit dcf.vermont.gov for more information or call 1-800-479-6151. Thank you, and I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you, Commissioner Winters. We'll now open it up to questions. You mentioned the mobile homes and on River Walk. Do you have a number on how many maybe were deconstructed or moved? And with that funding or the check from sewer, how many more you may be able to do going forward? Uh, we're going to do all of them at some point, make sure that we take care of every single one of them that needs to be de deconstructed one way or another. Um, I'd say we're, we're probably about maybe a little better than halfway through. Uh, I'd say there's maybe 50 or 60 of them in total, but that's just a guess on my part. Obviously, this is her decision to make. Uh, the state's attorney has that in their prerogative. Um, but, um, but I would say under the circumstances, depending on the information she has that I may not have, um, she's doing what she thinks is the best, and I, I, I support that. Um, also on that topic, do you, you know, is your administration taking any action in response to the unprecedented number of homicides and suspicious deaths that yeah. are taking place? Yeah, obviously uh, this is something that's a, a huge concern uh, to our administration. It's been building for a while and then um, it seems to have hit us all in one month. Uh, I will say, um, again, I mean we've seen some of maybe just a, a flavor of what was going to happen uh, in previous months. I still believe that there's some sort of connection, a thread, uh, maybe not uh, a connection um, entirely to one another, uh, one, uh, one uh, death or another, uh, or one murder. Uh, but um, the common thread I see is the uh, drug trafficking. And, uh, and I think that we've, we've seen that previously. We saw that in Brookfield and a number of other cases. And uh, I think that we'll see uh, when, when they get through the investigation that there may be a, a connection with um, some of these, not all of them, but some of these that we've seen this month. So we, um, our BSP is working nonstop. Our um, Vermont uh, um, information or um, Vic, our Vic uh, is working 24-7 uh, trying to, to work on these issues and, and trying to head off uh, any um, any acts of violence, but, um, but it's a lot to keep up with. Uh, it, it's unfortunate, but we're seeing this more and more uh, enter our state. Do you think the Vermont State Police has the resources that it needs to investigate all of these? There is no doubt um, that we are um, seeing the impacts of that overwhelm in some respects. We uh, we don't have enough troopers uh, to fill the need on a on a good day. Um, so I think uh, this has impacted them, but they've they've risen to the occasion. Uh, they're doing everything they can at this point, um, and I I believe we've received, if there's any good news, uh, some good news in the last day or so uh, about coming to some conclusion on on the the, the deaths, the investigations, and, and some arrests that have been made. So uh, I 
we have a long ways to go, uh, and we. Um, but I think uh, to say that you know we could use more help, more resources, more boots on the ground, uh, I think is obvious. But uh, but again, they've risen to the occasion. Anything you want to add to that? Um, not connected to those cases, but what was your reaction to the U fifty two school bus incident last Thursday? Yeah, um, again, I don't, I don't know if I have all the details. I mean, I've heard um, different aspects of it. I don't believe they found the projectile at this point, um, but we're assuming that it came from a, a stray, um, stray bullet, and they believe that it came from. The, the homeless encampment uh, as well, and they and they did confiscate a number of guns, so that is concerning. But I don't think it was uh, something that was uh, that, that was thought out, uh, and um, so again, concerning. Uh, but um, thankfully, no one was hurt. Is it troubling to you that they they confiscated? I think he has eight guns, um, and not all, not everyone in the house is population has guns or are bad people or anything, not trying to group anyone, but yeah. is that concerning to you that a lot has been made of Vermont's houses population in the last year with the Hotel Moto program uh, being changed up over the summer, I guess, how concerning was that to you, uh, the hearing that they found those? Admittedly, I was surprised to hear that there were so many that had, uh, had these weapons uh, in, in the encampment. Um, but um, and surprised at that, but um, but again, I guess it's just a sign of the times. Um, you know, so kind of staying in track with both of these a little bit. Uh, in light of all of these incidents, it was last August you released your public safety enhancement and violent reaction ten point plan. So I guess kind of looking back on that the past year and two months or so now, I guess how would you say that's going? Are there any changes or anything you'd like to add to that? Well, we just need to do more of it. I believe the, the foundation of that plan is still valid, and that we need to, to double down and do all we can, working with the communities uh, to make sure that we're all pulling in the same direction here. But, uh, and we'll be doing so. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be actively working with communities to do everything we can uh, to put this into place, because again, I, I believe the foundation of the plan uh, is still appropriate for this time. Governor, uh, you mentioned that the, the, the Karen uh, homicide was drug-related. Uh, Commissioner Morrison said a couple weeks ago the Watson one is likely not. Uh, and I wondered if, if you or the state uh, trooper officer here could, could comment on uh, White, Solomon, Estrada, Rodriguez, Gubia, and Fleming, the other victims. Which of those are believed to be drug trafficking related? Yeah, I, I can't answer that. Maybe Colonel Birmingham can. Um, but, but again, I would say that there are some that probably are connected in some way. Hi, good morning. Matt Birmingham, the director of the state police. Um, I can't get into specifics about um, which cases are connected, but the governor is correct. A majority of the eight homicides that we've seen this month are have a drug connection to them. Um, but it's too early in this process to definitively tell you that drugs were the driver behind it. But th those facts will come out in time. Well, can you can you talk about the specific cases? The, I'm not going to get into the, the specifics direction. of each of these cases. I can tell you that we are actively working all of them. Uh, we have teams out working diligently, conducting interviews. We're analyzing evidence. Um, and we're, we're doing a lot of technology work around these cases. Um, Major Trudeau gives weekly updates on these uh, online, and uh, he is the lead investigator on this, and he can provide the specifics if, if you're looking for those. And I can certainly put you in touch with him. That'd be great. So but the majority of the cases do have a some sort of drug connection to them? Yes. OK. okay. Yep. Thank you. Um, Senator Dick Sears, the chair of the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, um, has said that in view of the main shooting, he is open to discussing expanding Vermont's uh, red flag law. And he also said he wants to ban the sale of so-called ghost guns. Um, what do you think of that? 
Yeah, the, the ghost guns have been talked about on the federal level, and I believe that that's where we should have those conversations, but I'm happy to have conversations with him about that as well in the legislature. Um, I don't know what he wants to do with the red flag uh, laws to enhance those, but we did enhance them over the last uh, couple of years. I think that we're ahead of uh, many states in terms of what we did uh, back in 2018. Uh, with red flag laws and a number of other provisions that I think have helped. Um, but I think it's time for the, this to be a national conversation uh, with other states uh, and on a federal level to uh, and adopt some of the, the red flag laws that we've, we've gone ahead with. Right. But I guess, are you open to further restrictions in Vermont? Well, it depends on what he's talking about. Yeah, I, I don't have any idea. Uh, he hasn't he hasn't reached out to me to talk about any other changes he wants to make to red flag laws, but I don't know. I mean, has all of the gun violence that Vermont is seeing and the mass shooting in Maine made you think that perhaps Vermont should tighten its I, hands I think seeing what happened in Maine uh, confirms that we did the right thing in Vermont. So do you think that there are sufficient laws in place to prevent what happened in Maine from happening in Vermont? I don't know all the specifics, um, but it appears that um, much of what we did uh, may have prevented what happened there, but I don't know that to be the case. Um, but I'm, I'm confident that we did, um, I stand by what we did. I thought it was for the right reasons based on the affidavit that I read with the young man in uh, Fairhaven. And I think that it was the right decision to make, and um, we followed through on that. So it was difficult, but, but it was the right thing to do. Thank you. On the mental health side of that conversation, how confident are you that Vermont has the resources? I know at the Joint Justice hearing last week, they talked about short-term uh, solutions for juvenile facilities. Um, just wondering, obviously, VSCA called for a state of emergency, so I'm wondering what your response was to that, and also, um, you know, just in general, what you think of the resources that the state has? Yeah, well, we're under a, still under a state of emergency due to the flooding in July. Um, we have a housing crisis we're dealing with right now. I believe we have a workforce crisis as well. All of this dovetails together, whether we're talking about Vermont State Police, uh, and, uh, and adding more boots to the ground. We have positions available there, mental health counselors as well, educators, nurses. It's across the board. Every single sector uh, needs more people. We need more people in the workforce. I've been advocating for this for a number of years. I think it, we need housing as, as a, a portion of that, uh, but we need Vermont to be more affordable as well. Uh, to attract more people to the state and keep them here. So we're competing with other states uh, that, uh, that have a, a far less costly um, cost of living. And um, so we have to do whatever we can to keep taxes, um, try to reduce the tax burden on Vermonters and uh, entice people, more people to come. But we're going to need all of those pieces uh, to work together, uh, housing, trying to, uh, again, attract more people into the state and the businesses that need the help. It kind of just seems like it's a domino effect with everything happening. You're just kind of trying to patch holes uh, everywhere. Like it's, it's not the administration. It's, it's just the state of Vermont right now. I guess, do you see a light at the end of the tunnel with a lot of these things? Or how, how do you view that? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a long-term uh, turnaround here. There's nothing instantaneous about this. And it's not just about money and resources. It's about putting the right policies into place uh, that, uh, that will attract more people into the state. We, we suffer from a demographic crisis here in the state. We're aging. Um, and while that's, that's you know, we, we, we want to make sure that we, we protect and keep uh, the aging population here, uh, that's, that's a benefit to us. Uh, but as a result of that, we're not backfilling uh, the, the younger population, the workforce, uh, with the people we need uh, to continue. So, so again, 
on all these fronts. I think there is hope. I think there is a strategy in place. Um, but we all, again, have to work together in order to make all the pieces come together. Um, and, and part of that is the, uh, the strategy, uh, making sure uh, that we're working on the affordability of the state. I don't think we've done enough on that. And uh, it's something that I've been, wanting, I've been trying to work with the legislature on. But we can't keep taxing people and raising taxes and the cost of living on people here and expect them to stay or be able to survive here. So that's a, that's a piece that's a reality, and we're going to have to focus on that more in the coming session. Kind of switching gears a little bit, I'm curious. So we have the Twin States Clean Energy Link on the Vermont and New Hampshire border that will also go into Quebec. I'm kind of just wondering what thoughts you have on that in general, and a lot of it's also hydroelectricity from water that will be able to come into Vermont. Could this link potentially help the state meet those Global Warming Solutions Act deadlines coming up in 25, yeah. 30, and 50? I'm not sure that that will directly help us. It's just coming through a, a small section of Vermont. Um, the other, uh, the, the other uh, proposal, uh, having uh, it come down TDI coming down through Lake Champlain, uh, I think would uh, would benefit us financially, and uh, and I hope that uh, that is considered uh, on the federal level uh, to adopt. That would be helpful. But anything we can do to bring more uh, renewable energy into New England is going to help all of us. Uh, so. So we're part of we're part of this, um, and uh, and I believe that it could be helpful to, to each and every every state in New England. I have another question on uh, flood control dam. In the very very one, can, can the impoundment be increased through excavation? I know from traveling back and forth to over to Lake Murray, 302 floods often in the springtime. We used to don't have to be so tough. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if there's any more. We're we're doing studies on this. I don't know if um, Secretary Moore is on, but but we are doing studies on what we can do to enhance uh, some of the flood control dams. But I don't know about the elevations there. I don't know whether you could store anything more there or not uh, without impacting some of the highways. But Secretary Moore, are you on? Not. Okay, we'll get back to you on um, that. Did you have a chance to read the article in seven days called Grace? I read portions of it, and it's on my uh, in my stack of reading. Um, <laughs> Some of I, that occurred under your watch. Yep. And now uh, was signed as closed, and Grace has passed on. Um, it didn't appear from the article that you ever spoke about all of that. You, you put out some press releases and stuff. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, this is something that we were aware of uh, after the fact. It's hard to believe it happened. Yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> I, all places. I concur. Um, it's uh, certainly a black eye for us and uh, something that we um, took to heart. We closed Woodside as a result of that, and uh, we've been working to try and change um, ever since, um, but, um, but not quick enough, obviously. And you're shipping these young people out of state for treatment? We are, um, and we're trying to treat as many How as we can. How far away are they going? Uh, that might be a question for our commissioner, but, uh, but not all of them. Uh, we do have facilities here in Vermont, and we try and treat as many as we can here in the state. Just to add on to what the, the governor said, we do um, try to place these youth in community-based programs, and we have done that with a number of them. There are some local community-based. Local community there are some um, children who have needs that we can't actually attend to in Vermont, and they do go to some out-of-state programs. Uh, we visit those programs once a month to make sure we're checking in and make sure that they're getting the services that How they far need. Far away from their families they could, to visit. They could be anywhere in the United States. Uh, there's a program as far away as, as Arizona, where we recently had a youth. Um, there's some, I think, 30 to 40 youth in, in those situations. But as the governor said, we learned a lot from Woodside. We need to take lessons from what happened there and change our model of care to a more therapeutic approach. We're trying to move forward with building those facilities, uh, smaller facilities within Vermont that um, have secure stabilization and, and secure treatment. We don't have that upper end system of care 
Right now, we're working hard to restore that. Uh, but it's very important that we not repeat the mistakes we made in Woodside. Uh, I wasn't here at the time, um, but looking back in hindsight, there could have been better communication, better oversight. Uh, and we're actually doing a formal review internally now to make sure we really elicit all of those lessons learned uh, so that we don't repeat those mistakes. Uh, one, thing, one thing that really stuck out to me in the article about Woodside is um, how no one uh, who was in a position of power uh, you know, paid any sort of price. They weren't fired. It does not appear that they were disciplined. Uh, Jay Simmons, who was, um, you know, who led the facility, features prominently in the story, uh, you know, who was on tape uh, looking at a naked child who was harming herself and saying to another employee, I'd like you to get a close up, right? This was evidence that was introduced in the trial. He was not fired. Um, and in fact, when Woodside closed after a federal lawsuit, he was awarded another job with the Department of Children and Families. Why wasn't he fired? You can start. I mean, I'd really, I'd really like to hear from the governor here because he, that, that was not a decision under... I'll, I'll just start by saying that um, every case was reviewed. We have a contract that we have to adhere by with the union in pursuing Jason discipline. Wasn't a union member. And um, I will state that that particular employee is no longer working for the Department for Children and Families. Uh, but I can't, can't discuss dis disciplinary matters as much as we would like to. And I do want to say that our hearts go out to the families involved here for the harm that occurred. Um, we are going to do a review, but but um, going back and revisiting those employee decisions is not something that we can do. Uh, I have another question which really isn't relevant. Mm -hmm. to, oh, sorry. The first. Okay. Yeah. Well, again, had I known personally about that situation at the time, uh, we would have intervened sooner. Um, but I didn't know. Uh, I mean, and there was a lawsuit. There was a lawsuit, and it was public that you know a judge had reviewed this evidence, called it horrific. Like, why didn't you take an interest? Yeah, but we did take an interest. We closed Woodside down, as you recall. Um, but there are certain things. Um, it's a, um, it's it's an HR issue. Uh, it's not something uh, that we can always uh, do anything about uh, concerning the concerning the um, the union and so forth and some of the... Jay Simmons was not a union member. Not not a member of the union? He wasn't a state employee? He was not protected by... I, I asked the union this. They said, no, he was management. The decision to hire or fire him would have been up to the administration, and so it would have been the decision after Woodside was closed to move him to another... D head another DCF office? Well, again, had I known the extent of that issue at the time, uh, we might have done things differently, but we didn't. And I take re responsibility for that. Okay, sorry. This is just about speed limits. I'm glad the state police are here. But in driving on Vermont's interstate, um, people are going very fast. Uh, and they go through what seems to be a speed trap at 78, 79, 80 miles an hour, and the police don't chase whatever they do. Uh, so it used to be 75 was kind of the limit before they got involved in speeding tickets, but now it seems to be somewhat higher. And sometimes it's a little scary when they go by you, at, particularly when it's raining <laughs> at speeds that just are unsafe. Um, I'll let Colonel answer this one, but uh, from my standpoint, again, this is about resources, and uh, we have to prioritize our resources. Uh, we can't get to every single. We can't. We can't pull every single uh, speeder uh, over. No, I understand and, that. And, and and take up resources that we should be spending in other areas, uh, investigating some of the deaths and some of the things that are horrific things that are happening throughout Vermont. Um, so we have to. We have to make a choice. No, I understand, but 10 years ago, if I went by a trooper in the median at 78, I'd be pulled over. 
Yeah. Now I can go by 78 and nothing happens. Yeah. Well, again, I would say that, you know, 10, 20 years ago, things were a little bit different in Vermont. Uh, we didn't have the level of crime that we're seeing today. We don't see the, the policeman's already there. We, and we, and I know, but they have to they have to take the the opportunity uh, to pull somebody over when the, right. when there is there are more horrific things happening and uh, people are driving faster. You know, I I get that. Um. Well, first of all, for the record, the speed limit 65 on the interstate, so there's no magic speed that you get to go before you're stopped. Um, the governor's right. Well, this is a resource management issue for us. Um, traffic safety is a priority, uh, uh, one of our top priorities in the state police, and reducing traffic crash fatalities is a priority for the state police. Um, but given the, the fact that we have a 15% vacancy rate right now, we have 51 sworn positions that are not filled, uh, we have had to reallocate resources, uniform resources, to assist with these homicides. Uh, and there's just not enough of us out there to enforce the speed all the time. Um, I can tell you that speeds have increased over the last decade. Cars are faster. They're, they're built better. The roadways are designed and built better. Uh, so you're seeing higher speeds generally across the country. This is not a Vermont issue. This is a nationwide problem. Um, and so if, if you are enforcing speed rules, um, again, the speed limit is 65. There are grace periods. Troopers have um, the ability to, to make their own judgment about what speed is unsafe. We target, because of our resource, uh, our, our limited resources, we're targeting the most aggressive and dangerous drivers on the road. Uh, so that means we're targeting people who are weaving in and out of traffic, that are operating dangerously, that are using their cell phone while they're driving fast, that are impaired. Those are our priority, our priorities. And so when you have speeds of 90 to 100 miles an hour routinely, we're going to target those vehicles before we're targeting 78 or 80 uh, because they are more dangerous and they're putting other people's lives at risk on the interstate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thanks, sense. Um, I've seen... In downtown Burlington, there's still some state troopers there. Is that there a regular thing now? Uh, it's it's been in, in effect for a few months um, throughout the summer, and it's still in effect. It's a it's a volunteer uh, program that the city has asked for state police assistance to help bolster their dwindled department as well, and we've been doing it since the spring. Um, it is it's all volunteer, so we don't mandate that our people go there. Uh, the city of Burlington uh, pays for the overtime, so it is not it's not a burden on the state. Uh, but we still do have, from time to time, troopers sign up for that detail and assist the Burlington Police Department in the city. Okay. Thank you. We've got a few on the phones. We'll start with Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. The news about the uh, Twin State Clean Energy Link, does this sound like there's been so many proposals on bringing more power from Canada? Does this sound like, are you more optimistic that this one will happen? Um, it's, it certainly seems as though this could happen, but I'm not sure it's going to happen in the time frame that they're envisioning, but we'll see. Um, I'm, I'm never surprised uh, by um, the pushback in terms of anything to do with utilities uh, going through any state at this point in time. We've seen it in Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. Um, so I, I, we'll see what happens, but, um, but, I'm, but I'm hopeful because we need to get as much of this renewable energy from from Canada because they have the resources and they have um, they have the uh, the renewable energy uh, that uh, is available at this point in time uh, to help satisfy our needs here in New England does the fact that the DOE is going to um, guarantee some purchase and that they're going to bury the lines in Vermont um, is does that help the cause, in, in your view? In, in what way, Tim? You mean? Well, as far as, like, you know, the, the regulatory issues, the pushback that you mentioned, and the fact that, you know, if the DOE is committing some money to it, then other um, um, investments could, could more easily happen. Well, we certainly hope so. Um, again, I, I am hopeful that the TDI line will be considered as well because that would be um, that would be more beneficial financially beneficial uh, to to Vermont and that's uh, that's all permitted ready to go um, so we hope uh, that they will consider that one as well 
that, that was going to be my follow up. Have you heard anything more from the TDI since last? I think it was last February you mentioned it. I, I have not heard anything um, of any substance since then. Okay. All right. Thank you, Governor. I mean, I have sent a letter uh, asking uh, for the federal government to support that. Uh, so uh, that's been done, but I haven't heard it, you know, what the um, what the odds are of us uh, of that moving forward, but I'm still hopeful. Okay, great, thanks. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'd like to circle back on uh, the, on the speeding issue. Um, I don't think anybody in Vermont would disagree with the with the problem as identified uh, by your governor and also by the state police. We understand there's a a reduction in the number of people that we want to fill jobs for in the state police. We also understand people like to drive fast. Anybody who's driven through Emporia, Virginia, knows that as soon as you hit that line on I-95, you'll probably see six or seven local police officers there uh, who are monitoring the speed. And if there's one place in the United States they don't speed, it's Emporia, Virginia. Um, has there been any discussion or is there the ability, understanding that a lot of the local municipal police forces aren't exactly fully stocked either, but to allow them to at least help police the sections of the highway that fall within their geographic boundaries? That's one question. Uh, and then the second one is, what about if, if cars go faster, why don't the punitive measures uh, increase? to the point where there's more deterrence. Uh, and what has to happen for that to take place? A couple things. I'll let uh, Colonel Birmingham uh, confirm this. I, I believe that local law enforcement can, uh, they can um, be in that section, like on 89, uh, town of Berlin can be uh, there uh, watching the speed limits and pulling people over, as can any other. I think Washington County sheriffs could as well, and that goes for any of the, these communities along the uh, the corridor. So I think they have that ability now, but but I would say, as you mentioned, uh, they are uh, not exactly. Uh, Burlington was just mentioned uh, as well. They're down on on the number of officers on the ground, and I think most law enforcement are in the same boat as as I said previously. Every single sector in Vermont is impacted. Whether we're talking about the trades. Um, whether it's carpenters or electricians or plumbers or uh, law enforcement or educators or nurses, healthcare, all across the board, everyone is impacted. So I, I believe that local communities uh, have a void as well to fill. Uh, in terms of the progression of fines, I, I believe it does progress uh, in terms of the higher the speed, uh, the more uh, punitive that is. Um, so uh, any law enforcement officer in the state of Vermont can patrol and stop anyone for speeding on any roadway. The interstate is not exclusive to the state police, uh, but the law enforcement resources to the governor's point are stretched thin in all departments, not just the state police, local sheriff, uh, so they don't have the resources either to patrol the interstate. Uh, it is primarily our responsibility, uh, given the nature of the fact that it goes through, you know, multiple towns and towns are answering calls for service and they don't necessarily want their local police uh, managing the interstate. They'd rather have them answering calls for service in their communities where their taxpayers are, are paying for them to operate. Fines are uh, incrementally higher as the speeds go up and if you reach a certain speed you can actually be arrested and charged with a crime. So there are there are significant penalties for, for driving ex dangerously. And then there are other crimes, careless and negligent operation if you're if you're all over the road or putting people's lives in danger. Uh, so not only is there a ticket, but it, it can become a criminal offense at some point. Uh, thank you for that. I, it, it seems that, first of all, there's some revenue generation for the tickets that might help municipalities. And I think Vermonters would continue to argue that uh, if, if people aren't disincentivized enough uh, to slow down the current uh, punitive measures, then those punitive measures have to be increased to make it just not worth their while. Um, uh, something that we see a lot from our readers. Uh, one more question, uh, Governor, you had mentioned, and I know you've got plenty on your plate, but uh, 
Uh, do you think it will be reasonably soon? We'll see Dr. Levine at uh, one of your press conferences. Yeah, yeah, we'll be bringing him on uh, sometime along. We have a few things we want to uh, talk about in the meantime. Uh, obviously, uh, first and foremost is uh, is some of the housing and, and heat heating needs. Uh, we want to make sure we're we're working on that and uh, getting through this emergency. But uh, we'll have him on shortly. Uh, Tom, getting back to your other, I, I, maybe Colonel Birmingham has the answer to this one, but. The, the fines associated with with uh, a speeding penalty doesn't that go into the general fund or is that uh, so uh, it, any any speeding ticket that is written on a state highway or the interstate goes into the state general fund um, if it is written under a certain code on a local or municipal speed zone then it will go into the into the municipal budget so any local police officer that, that who, who is writing a traffic ticket on the interstate will go to the to the general fund for the state, not the local municipality. Okay, I appreciate the clarification. No other questions. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up? Yep. Uh, it, it, it seemed that you said in all of that that the problem of plumbers and nurses and doctors and teachers and educators and policemen is related to. The, to the cost of life here? Well, no. Uh, I mean, that's I mean, not, have you not done it, focus groups yeah. to find out why people leave? Or? It, it's, it's not just that they leave. It's just we're not we're not having as many kids. I mean, we see it in our schools. Something I talked about a lot uh, seven years ago when I was running for governor um, that we have fewer kids in our schools, so we're having fewer kids. I mean, think about the I'm amount. Of, yeah, well, thank you for, for that. Um, but, you know, when you look back at uh, the number of kids who were, we had over 100,000 kids in our K through 12 uh, back about 2025. Yeah. But so, I mean, that's real, though. I mean, there's, so there's 30,000 less today. So that tells you something. It's not just about the number of people here, it's just we're not having the, the size of families and so forth, which means. We need more families moving in, which means we need more housing as a result. Affordable. Affordable housing. All housing. Can I ask one more question? Um, actually, about Lakey, about what the press conference is about. Um, well, that would be unique. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, uh, I know there was a lot of concern um, kind of post, you know, federal windfall about Lakey funding because it went up by a ton during the pandemic, uh, and then it dropped off. Obviously, costs have increased. And I was just wondering, uh, last year, when we actually received a little bit more than this year, I think, for Lakey, I, I mean, was it oversubscribed, right? Do we have more people who want Lakey funding than, than are able to get it? To get back to you on that. Yeah. I think it's good news if we didn't hear that there was more need than there was um, the amount of money necessary for that but I, I didn't hear uh, that we were we were lacking in resources but we'll, we'll get back to you on that all right thank you oh okay uh, so my last question is kind of circling back a little bit to crime talking about where we were to begin with so Vermont and a lot of its municipalities I guess you could argue of some of the looser laws when it comes to states and Vermont's kind of taken the perspective, you know, rehabilitate these people, give them second, third chances. Do you think whether it's the administration or maybe the legislature needs to look at maybe cracking down more? Because a lot of these people that do end up getting arrested and become suspects are repeat offenders that were given those multiple chances and then their crimes kind of just continue to escalate. Yeah, oh, I think there needs to be a conversation with the legislature about repeat offenders. And, uh, and I think people have to be held accountable in some way. I believe in second, third, Fourth, I guess, decisions um, as a path forward, uh, but but at the same time, I believe uh, the repeat offenders that we're seeing need to be held accountable. Some of our youth need to be held accountable um, so that we don't create another generation of, uh, of of those who are going to be part in the system, so to speak. So. This needs to be a balance, um, but um, but I think we're out of balance a bit there. Um, 
Governor, could you explain why we don't need to have the, the tags on the license plates? I understand the law was passed as part of the T-bill, I guess, but what is the, the thinking about it? Why we don't need those? Anymore? I think it was it was all resources. I think this is a combination of, of our department and the legislature working together on this to try and reduce some costs, uh, knowing that with the inspection process that you have to have a valid registration in order to uh, to get through the inspection process. So that, in effect, if you have a if you have an inspection sticker, then you you're registered. Um, so you don't have to look for the for the sticker on the uh, on the plate itself. Uh, so you have the number there. So it may not be as instantaneous, but but eventually there's that way to to oversee it. Thank you all very much.